Um, If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Got to get got to get the Bible study started, right? Just kidding. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for this evening, Lord, and we thank you for the time of worship to, Lord, just to be able to proclaim your awesomeness, Lord, and how much we love you and how wonderful you are, and Lord, what a great joy it is to be able to sing songs to the King of Kings and to the one who's changed our life, the one who's saved us from our sins and cleansed us and washed us clean and given us hope for that one day that we'll be able to proclaim and seeing how great our God and Lord, we're so we're so Lord just blessed to be in your presence and and Lord we pray now that your word as we look into your word Lord that you would speak to us and show us Lord the things that you're wanting to say to us that you want to do in our lives as we consider examples Lord you've given us in your word people that you decided to inspire men to write down their story and men that you chose to do great things through Uh, Men who are weak, men who failed, men who maybe the world wouldn't have chosen, but you chose them, Lord, and you did great and wondrous things. So we pray, Lord, that somehow that would apply to our lives, that you would do great things in us, and Lord, we would be able to look to you in all of it. And so bless tonight. Uh, We pray for Pastor Rich and and Nick. We pray for their time at the, the conference there and their time with Dave and pray you would just bless them and use them mightily, encourage uh, the church there and the believers and, and all. And so we just pray you um, bring them home safely as well, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 6, I, um, I been in Genesis, my own devotions, and there's been c- kind of a few, few days in a row where, um, where I've been, been teaching, and it's kind of hard for me to think about the next Bible study before I've taught the first Bible study, if that makes sense, right? So I, I think I did a junior high thing on Friday, then I teach the kids on Sunday, and then here tonight. And so it was hard for me on Thursday to think that far ahead. Like, man, Sunday night seems so far away. Like, there's two Bible studies that I have to do before Sunday. And as I was considering um, what just the Lord's been speaking in my own heart and, and just considering some passages... Um, the Lord kind of put this on my heart to do to, to do Genesis chapter 6, even though I, I, I read it a few weeks ago in my devotions, but it's just been kind of um, a theme maybe in my own heart. So some of this is going to be um, a little bit what the Lord's been kind of stirring me up, um, the application part of it, I would say, and and the example and the, and the time in which... Uh, you know, Genesis chapter 6, we're going to speak of Noah and the time that he lived, but in the day in which Noah lived, and, and considering the day in which I live, uh, considering the decisions that Noah made, the obedience that he had, the, the uh, uh, you know, we'll look again at his character a little bit, but, but it's just been kind of stirring up in my heart of just looking at this guy, and though you know, we know he'll make some mistakes later on, but, but before that, um, he seems to have a pretty good reputation. So, Genesis chapter 6, the other thing about this chapter is we're only in chapter 6. <laughs> so if you know that the book of Genesis is what? The book of beginnings. It's, it's you open up chapter 1, and the beginning was the word, or, you know, the beginning was God. John chapter 1 was the beginning, it was the word. But, you know, you open up in, in Genesis chapter 1, he's, it's the creation. It's the, it's the beginning. Like, it's not, it's not there's been, there's been, you know, this humankind for, uh, humanity for thousands of years, and then and then we get Genesis chapter one. It's it's the very beginning. So by the time you get to chapter six, which is only five, really five chapters, five full chapters before you get to chapter six, the world in which the that was created, the men that were in it, the corruption, the 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 selfishness, the the immorality, all the things that um, that that the world can can obviously do, bring to. It's come to a point where God, in his, even in his full of grace, looks at the world and says, this, this is not good. Um, we know, obviously, we have the fall of, of Adam and Eve, and then the murder of, uh, you know, Cain murdering his brother. And really, those are really the main stories. And then we have chapter 6, 
the pro- like it's I, I guess it's a promise, but it's promised that because God because God said it and it, it happened. But in chapter six, you have God saying, "I'm going to destroy the earth." In six chapters, man, that doesn't. That's like, man, you guys messed it up in five chapters, you know. And and it didn't take very long. It didn't take very long for for man to think of of evil things, to corrupt the world, to corrupt society, to 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 go on a, a to go to a, a a moral spiral down to destruction. It didn't take very long, and it's just an interesting time that Noah lived because I can't help but think and read it and think, man, is my world much different than Noah's? And we'll read it and. We can make our own uh, assessment, our own judgment. But in chapter 1, it says, Now it came to pass, I mean, verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they choose. Um, if you want to know what that verse means, I have no idea. So you can read in someone who knows. Um, I had one of my, when I was early a uh, early Christian. I had someone ask me, "What does this verse mean? The sons of God took up daughters." I was like, "You know what? I just got saved. I'm not going to hell anymore, so I don't know." Um, you know, and I and I don't know that I have a better understanding of it completely. There's a lots of different opinions about it. It's really not necessary um, to really take that much time on it, other than keep in mind the 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 state of what the world was was in this day. It was it was completely corrupt, completely immoral, completely devastating. And it says, the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So anybody over 120 in this room? Okay, cool. Just want to make sure God's, God's word is true. Um, I'm sure there is probably some 121-year-old somewhere. Um, it says they were they were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children with them, and those who were mighty men, um, and these aren't like David's mighty men; these were more um, men that were just bring destruction, uh, who were old, uh, many of many of uh, renown. And then it says in verse five, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man, and this is kind of a a commentary as, as, as much as it is a, um, a statement. He says, he says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a pretty strong statement. If you think about what the writer here is saying, if we're assuming it's Moses who's writing these things, and most people believe that, Moses is writing years after this would happen, you know, stories that he's heard passed down, and obviously inspired by God to write these things down. The phrase that he uses, now, obviously, Genesis is written in Hebrew, we're reading in English, but this, the idea is still the same. This idea that the, the earth had gotten to a point where the men that were in it, every thought that they had in their heart was evil. That means they didn't really have any, any good thoughts. They didn't really think, man, let me help somebody. The only thoughts they had continually were evil. How can I fulfill my flesh? How can I, how can I fulfill the desires of, of, my, of my heart or my flesh or the things that are pleasing to me or pleasurable? You know, how, only continually thinking of these things, never thinking about God, never thinking about the works of God and what he could do and what, um, what good can come of, of things, only evil. And it's an interesting thing when the, you know, when a society gets to that point where the only things they can think of are evil. The only things they can think of, like, how do we change our, our society? Well, let's just wipe everyone out. Or how do we, how do we change something? You know, well, let's, get, let's, let's exterminate this group of people. Or let's, let's isolate these group of people. Or, you know, the, the solutions only become evil. You, you know that a society, a group of people, a, a generation has gotten so corrupt that when they start thinking only evil continually, it can't be good. It just is not a good, good place to be. And then it says in verse, uh, verse 6, it says, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. That's a pretty sad statement. You think of, the, you think of when God created man. When, when he made the earth and he, you know, he formed it and he, you know, we, he spent those many days making and creating things. And then on that last day, he created man. And what, what did he create man for? For his pleasure. 
so that, so that Adam could walk in the cool of the day with God and fellowship with him. And there was supposed to be this relationship, this, this, this wonderful bond between man and God, this relationship that was, was beautiful and perfect and awesome. God created man for a purpose, but a purpose that, man, I have a plan for your life. I, 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 I created you so that we can have a relationship. How awesome is that? Like, God didn't just create man so that he can have a bunch of slaves and build pyramids or build things and work them to the bone. He built man so that, so that there can be a, a relationship. He built man so that, there, so that, so that man could worship God and have, and have that communion, that fellowship with him. It's a beautiful thing that God created man. And now you have God saying, man, I wish, I'm sorry that I made man. You think of Adam. <laughs> I made, like, I was just thinking of, of all the things that God had in his mind when he created Adam, how wonderful it was. Even for Adam to walk with God, to talk with him, you know, to have that relationship with him. And then now get to a point where God says, man, I'm sorry that I made him. Now, it isn't that, you know, God was sorry, like we're sorry. You know, we do something bad. We do something that we shouldn't have done. And then we say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's not that really. It's, it's just kind of, it's gotten to a point where, where God is, is more sorry of what needs to happen rather than like, oh, I can't believe I made man. That was such a mistake. Won't do that again, you know, or whatever. Like, like somehow, you know, he, he made a mistake by, by, by creating man. It was, man has gotten to a point where the only, the only really solution is judgment. The only really solution is that we got to start clean. We got to start over. And that's, I think, probably more of what God was sorry for is the, the, the judgment part. I don't think that God took some sort of pleasure in, in what he was going to, going to do. I don't think he was sitting there saying, man, these guys are really corrupt and they're, they're against me. They don't want to do anything I say. I'm just going to make it rain and just flood the earth. So I think the sorry part of it or the... Um, I don't, I, I, I don't think regret is the right word, but the grief that he had in his heart was, I have, to, I have to bring judgment. And I don't think God took pleasure in that. I think it probably, in some ways, broke his heart, and if you can say such a thing. So, so he says that he was sorry that he made man on earth. He was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creepy, creepy thing, um, creepy, creeping, <laughs> and creepy probably, um, creep, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So that's kind of the point you get to in Genesis chapter 6. The wickedness, the continually thinking of evil things, the, the, the giants in the land, the destruction of it, the sons of God taking daughters that they shouldn't, they shouldn't take, um, you know, multiplying in ways they shouldn't multiply, just the wickedness of the world. And God gets to a point where his, man, his heart is grieved. It's in a place where, where he, he realizes that, man, I, I'm going to have to destroy man. It's a, it's a pretty sad commentary or sad position or chapter to be in because it's, it's just one of those things where you think, man, it got really bad. You know, it got, it, it, it got to a point where if God said it's done, you know it has to be bad. Because I live in a world that's pretty bad. And as, as of 645, we're still here, so it's good. But I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what the next week brings or the next few years or whatever. But, but Noah didn't live in a day that's much different than ours. Men continually thinking of evil, doing things they shouldn't do, fulfilling the lusts of their uh, you know, fulfilling the pleasures and, and the things of their flesh. So that's the state of the world that's in. Now, a great verse in chapter 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's a great statement. That even though that the world was in this wicked state, that everyone seemed to be, you know, doing what was right in their own eyes, everybody seems to be living after the flesh, but here's this guy, Noah, found grace. The first time you're going to see the word grace in the Bible um, it's, a, it's a word that's going to continue on through the, through the course of the Bible, and certainly in the New Testament, we're saved by grace. Paul said, I'm saved by grace. It's not works, not anything I've done. I can't boast in it. It's the grace of God. I've received the forgiveness of sin because of the grace of God. And here, Noah is going to be somewhat of a picture of that. He's going to destroy the earth. God's going to destroy the earth through a flood, but he's going to save Noah and his household. He's, gonna, he's going to take Noah, and he's going to command him, and we'll look at that a little bit, but he's going to take this guy who um, we don't know much about him before this, but 
you know, he wasn't perfect. We know that. But he was a just man. He walked with God. He was righteous in his generation or perfect in his generation. We'll, we'll read in a minute. But God took him and, and looked at the earth and t- said to, to Noah, man, there's grace there. He found that Noah found grace in the, in the eyes of the Lord. It's a great, um, it's a great picture, I think, of, of that, that, that theme that's going to be throughout the whole Bible, the grace of God. Even though God will judge uh, nations and, and do a lot of things that people will say, that's not very gracious, but there's always a, there's always a, a, a lesson or some sort of, of um, grace message in those things. That, hey, I'm going to destroy you, but I'm going to bring you back. You know, the, uh, I'm going to take you from your land, but after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to do this, and this is going to happen to you, but don't worry, you're going to be restored. You know, David, David... Uh, you know, through your seed, you know, through, the, through your throne, I mean, through the, the line of David, the throne of David will become the Messiah. David made a ton of mistakes, but even though he made those mistakes, the very Messiah would come through the throne of David. So, um, so a message of grace throughout the whole Bible, really starting from here. And, and, it, and there was a message before that. I mean, Adam and Eve, certainly a message of grace, but this is kind of where we are introduced to that thought. And then it says, in this, gene- this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and he walked with God. So that's, that's Moses' character, I mean, uh, uh, Noah's character. That's who he is. He's a just man. He's a man that would, would be fair to people, or, or he would he, he'd be someone who uh, could be relied on, or someone that you would look to for, for something to say, you know what, man, I have a question about this. Let's go to Noah. You know, Noah might have the answer. Mo, Mo, Noah will have a good perspective or, or a fair judgment. Um, perfect in his generation. Um, the, the, the idea here isn't that he's perfect, that he's never sinned, but uh, someone of good reputation, someone who, someone who was, was known in his generation, his culture, and lived a certain way. He wasn't like the world. He wasn't, he wasn't like the chapters or the, the verses that we read previously. He was someone who, who, as far as we can tell, tried to live somewhat righteous. And then Noah walked with God. Now, there are a few terms in the Bible or a few phrases in the Bible where you see this. Um, Enoch walked with God, and he was walking with God, and then he wasn't walking with God, right? God took him up. Uh, we, we know there's a few people in the Bible. Um, obviously, Adam walked with God. But in, the, in this phrase here that Noah walked with God, you don't really hear that much in the first few chapters. You have, you have Adam, and then you have Enoch, and that's it. I mean, not to say there wasn't probably more people, but as far as what we have recorded, you have Adam walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden, and then you have Enoch um, who walked with God, and then you have Noah. So Noah's in kind of a short list of people that walked with God, you know? Um, now, I don't think um, there's no really language here that would say that there was like a, a physical... Um, physically walking with God, but maybe it's possible, I guess. There's nothing that says that that can't be true. But he walked with God. And it says, Noah begot three sons, and then the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh corrupted their way on the earth. So that's, that's the comment, that's the state of the world. That's what's happening in Noah's day. He's living in a world that no one wants to follow God. No one cares. They don't care that Adam, you know, walked with God or was with God. They don't care that he was created by God. They don't care that, that even though Cain killed his brother, God allowed him to kind of restore his, his um, uh, really his family, you know. He gave him, preserved his life, allowed him to be, get married, have kids, and, and, and really Noah would be a byproduct of that. Noah's from the line of Cain. And so there's, there's grace throughout all these things and, and God's mercy and love towards his people, and the people have no interest in it. They have no desire to do what's right. They only want to fulfill what, they, what their desires are. And, and it gets to a point where God says, I'm done. But here's this guy, Noah. Seems to be pretty, pretty awesome. So, and God said to Noah, verse 13, And all the flesh um, has come before me um, of the earth, Filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark um, 
uh, of this certain wood and make rooms. And he's going to give these descriptions of, of what the ark's supposed to be and how long it's supposed to be and, and, and everything. And we're not necessarily going to get into that for time's sake. But he tells him to build this ark. And he's going to tell him that it's going to rain for 40 days. Right? So here's, you know, they're living on this earth. They're wicked. They, God wants to destroy it. He's got this, 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 this idea that I'm going to let, I'm going to flood the earth. And he says to them, Noah, build us a boat, this giant boat. It's going to be, I think, 400 plus feet long. It's going to take 120 years to build, which that's a pretty big boat. Um, I've never built a boat, but it would probably take me 120 years, no matter what size it was. But, you know, he's going to give these very details. He's going to say, uh, he, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring, he goes, and behold, I'm, uh, verse 17, I myself am bringing uh, flood waters of the earth to destroy the under heaven, all flesh in which uh, is beneath of life, everything that is in the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. So here's the promise that God's given to Noah, that, that, I, that you'll be protected, you're going to save your household. You shall go into the ark and your sons and your wife and your son's wife with you, and every living uh, thing in the flesh shall bring two, two of every animal to keep them alive with you, and you shall have a female and a male. For the birds of the air and the animals after their kind. And then he's going to list a bunch of them. And then at verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him to do. So he did. So God gives him this, this order, this promise, if you would, that I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going, to just, I'm going to wipe out everything under the heavens. Everything that's alive is going to be done away with. But I'm going, to, I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. I'm going to establish something new. So save every animal. Get every one female, one male, so that you can multiply. You know, gather them up. You're going to fit them in this little boat. Well, it's not really a little boat. It's going to be a big boat. But, but if you think about all the animals, I don't know how many animals there are. Um, I remember reading or no, a listening to a really smart guy teach the Bible. And I think he named every, or the number of species that is on the earth today. It was, it was a lot. But I don't know if that was that many back then. But, but you're gathering all these people and you're saying, man, get them in the boat and then, and then build this thing. And it's going to be made out of this certain wood and this length. And, and the whole details we have in chapter, between chapter 6 and 7. And then it says Noah did it. And to me this is remarkable because... If you know, you know, the first five chapters, as far as my our understanding, is that it's never rained before. So God says, I'm going to bring flood, I'm going to flood the earth. There's, now we know that water comes, the water is going to be coming up uh, from the earth, but it's also going to rain. So you, you're told by God to build this boat, and it's going to, because of the wickedness of the world, and it's going to rain, and you're going to be the guy who builds the boat, and it's going to take 120 years. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that God told him it was going to, that's how long it was going to take, but that's how long it took. And every single day, Noah, and we're going to jump to Hebrews here in a minute, but Noah warns the people. Noah's telling the people, hey, this is coming. You know, uh, Jesus would give a commentary that people got married up until the day of Noah, like the day of the flood, you're having your wedding. Can you imagine that? It would be a bummer. Oh, man, I'm getting married today. It's going to be awesome. You know, I'm finally going to marry my bride. It's going to be great. And then he's like, man, it's kind of raining. What's, what is this? It's kind of cloudy, man. I picked a bad day to get married. And all of a sudden it starts raining. And all of a sudden it doesn't stop raining. And all of a sudden it starts flooding and people get wiped out and killed. And your honeymoon is done. Like, you know, we, we, uh, we got to witness a hurricane. Our, our honeymoon was quite exciting. We stood on the shore and our, and my wife and I's honeymoon, and we watched. It didn't hit. It kind of went around us, thankfully. But we had probably 50 family members, phone messages when we got reception, people calling the hotel. Are you guys okay? But, but we sit on the shore, and, and it, I mean, it literally looked like the heavens opened up, and it was just, it was more rain than I've ever seen in my entire life. And the thunder was like you had to plug your ears. I mean, it was cracking so hard. I mean, it was unbelievable. The wind, I mean, the palm trees were sideways, and we were sitting there, I think I had frozen yogurt, actually. I was holding frozen yogurt. <laughs> because, you know, like those, like those resorts, you get like all you can eat, frozen yogurt or whatever, you know. And, and, but I remember like every time, the, every time there was a, a, like a, a, a thunder, I mean, it would, I would shake. It was so loud and so powerful. And so, you know, if you think about 
like the 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 destruction or what God is saying here and realizing that they've never they've never seen this before. This has never happened before. They don't, you know, we see floods and we see the devastation of it. We see, you know, if you lived in Sacramento, you know, a long time, you remember, you know, the floods we had in 97 and um, I remember being being a kid with my my black uh uh circle tube out in the street floating around in the nasty dirty water. I don't know what I was thinking. But um, had my little paddle out there <laughs> on the streets, and so anyway, but you know, it brought a lot of destruction. Many homes were destroyed, levees broke. You see the hurricanes in New Orleans. It's tragic, and what's going to happen is is these floods are going to happen, and the water's going to come, and all the people who were 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 drinking and being merry and getting married and and living like there was, you know, like like t- you know like there's no tomorrow are going to be destroyed. It's a heavy judgment. It's not like it's going to be, man, you guys are going to have some bad weather. <laughs> you know, you guys are going to endure some really cold nights or whatever, but it's going to be a destructive flood that's going to wipe out the earth. And Noah was called to do this incredible thing to build this boat. And if you flip over to Hebrews chapter 11, we have uh, the writer Hebrews giving us a little bit more insight. Hebrews chapter 11. I think I said 12, but I meant 11. The famous faith chapter, the hall of faith chapter, some call it. Um, the writer describing all these different people that did things out of faith or because of faith. Um, he starts really from the beginning and works his way um, all the way to the end of the chapter with Moses and and uh, you can read it sometime. And, but in, our, in verse 7, we have Noah. And it says that Noah, being divinely warned of the things not seen, moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So Noah here... The writer, the writer of Hebrews says that it was by faith Noah did this. And this is an interesting thing to think about, that, that when God comes to Noah and says, I need you to build this thing, I need you to build this boat, there's really, he gives us some details, but there's not really anything else after that. He just says, hey, this is what's happening, this is what's going to happen, you need to build this boat. And it says Noah just did it. There wasn't any, any really kind of like, well, why, or questioning God, or, or figuring out, you know, well, are you sure you really want to use this kind of wood, God? Because this wood doesn't really float very well. I think you need to use this kind of wood or whatever, you know, whatever kind of excuses that someone can make when God begins to, to, to tell you to do something. It says that by faith, Noah, he being divinely warned, God told him, like, these things are going to happen. Now, the remarkable thing is that these things haven't happened yet. He said they're going to happen, but Noah did it. And this is, a, this is the, the application part, or some of it, is that when, when God begins to tell us to do something, or he instructs us to do something, he warns us, or, or he maybe tells us to, to step out of faith or to do something, it's usually going to be something we haven't seen yet. It's going to be something that we don't know what's going to happen. It's not going to usually, I, I was, I, I want to be careful overstating, but it's almost never going to happen that God's going to say, okay, you go here, and this is what's going to happen. You go to this city, and, and millions of people are going to get saved when you go there. Usually, that's not how it works. Usually, it's, hey, why don't you move your family here? And then you're like, why? <laughs> you know, or maybe it's, you know, why don't you take this job? And it's like, uh, I don't know, Lord, if you know, this job actually pays less, and it's lame, <laughs> or whatever, you know. And, and, and it's, it's usually something, it's, a, it's, it's God comes to us and says, do this. And we're, we're stuck in this, we're not stuck, but we're faced with this tension, this decision that we have to make. Am I going to do what God says, or am I not going to do it? And Noah was faced with that. Noah looks at the world and says, yeah, I know the world's pretty messed up. You're going to destroy it. You want me to do what? You want me to build a boat? How, how am I going to do that? Who's going to help me? Are we going to, are we going to hire a construction crew? 
um, the very construction crew that's going to be killed in this in this this flood. Like, what, what am I going to? How am I going to hire people? Like, okay, I uh, need help. Put in the newspaper. Hire. I need someone to help build a boat. But you're going to die in the judgment after. Or you know, how do you explain that? You don't. No one's going to help you. <laughs> so you're going to build it by yourself. Maybe maybe you have some kids so that they can do some chores for you. And be like, hey, right, so we have some. We're going to have more kids, honey, so that we can get more help on this boat, right? So you maybe have some kids so that they can. Put the put the board help put the boards on and and you know get the deck ready or whatever, but you're not going to have help. You you don't have any experience. You're going to build a boat in the wilderness where there's no water, and you're gonna you're just going to believe that God is going to going to say what he what he you know be true to his word. Well, Noah says yes. Noah says yeah, because it says he was divinely warned of the things to come and he moved with godly fear. Now, some people will translate this word or commentate on this word of this reverence, like he, the fear of the Lord, right? Um, this kind of like, oh, man, yeah, it's just I fear the Lord. I'm just, you know, I, 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 the Lord's awesome and powerful and wonderful, and I have this healthy fear of the Lord. I kind of look at this story. Maybe I'm wrong. I look at this passage and think he was, God, he, he was moved with godly afraid, <laughs> right? Godly fear, like in the sense of like you and I being, having fear. Like, I'm going to build this boat, and what's going to happen? Because we know that people, people make fun of him, you know, they, they mock him, they tell him that he's wrong, they tell him he's lost his mind, they tell him he's crazy, you know, what are you doing, what do you think this is going to happen? You know, we know the persecution somewhat that happens, and we know, we know that, that it was very difficult, we know that, that Noah, it wasn't very easy for Noah to build this. In fact, it took a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, a lot of wood, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of pre- preparation to build this. And so there, there naturally, um, you know, there's this godly fear that drove him to do this. And this is what's great about when God calls you to do something. Usually, he'll tell you to do something, and you don't really know, you can't really see the end result. Because remember, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the idea of walking by faith would be something that I'm walking by faith, believing that God is going to do what he says, even though I can't see it, even though I don't know what the result's going to be. So Noah was told to do this. He's walking by faith. There's something that's going to happen that he doesn't know. He can't see it. He's just believing that God said it, and it's going to happen. And then... There's this thing that goes in your stomach when God tells you to do something. I don't know if you've ever had this feeling where you think, okay, man, I'm ready. I'm going to do it. God told me to do it. I'm going to step out. And then all of a sudden you feel like this knot in your stomach like you're going to throw up. <laughs> Usually I feel this way every time I teach. Anytime the kid, even with the kids. I told the kids that a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, I've been teaching the Bible now for a little bit. And I still, you know, it's nervous, like nerve-wracking. Like I got to get and explain the Word of God to nine-year-olds. Man, that's tough way easier here than that classroom. But, you know, there's something when you step out in faith, there's something in, 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 your, in your body or in your flesh that says, this is not a good idea. You shouldn't be doing this. You're going to make yourself look foolish, or you're not going to say the right thing, or you're going to make a mistake, or you're going to fail, or you're going to fall flat on your face, or people won't listen to you. People will reject you. You'll get fired, or, you, or your family will get, you know, cast you out. There's a number of things that can happen when God tells you to do something. There's this fear that comes inside of you, and what you do with that fear will, will, will really tell the course of, of your whole life, because Noah we have our, his story in the Bible. So he took that fear, and instead of saying, well, God, I'm not building that boat, you get somebody else. I'm going to get my little rafter, my little raft out, and, and hope for the best, right? But he does it. He takes that fear, and I don't think, I think people, um, and, and again, maybe I'm wrong on this, but, you know, people will say, well, you shouldn't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid, God's, God's going to take care of it. And that is true in a sense. But there's lots of things I do that I'm afraid of. There's lots of times I step out in faith and think, what am I doing? I am a, I'm afraid. But it's what I do with that fear. Do, am I going to trust God is going to provide for me? Is God, God going to show himself faithful? Or am I going to, to not do it? Or am I going to back out and, be, and let fear have the victory? So it's not necessarily, it's not wrong to be afraid when God tells you to do something. 
In fact, you probably should be in some cases, right? I mean, but it's, it's what you do with that fear. Say, okay, I'm afraid, God. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not qualified. I'm not capable of doing this. I don't have the money, the energy, the strength, all the number of things that, you're, that you can't do it. But, but this is where, this is the big, the big, uh, the big idea where, where we kind of cross that barrier because it says, um, let's see, the godly fear prepare for the ark, saving his household by which he commanded the world or condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness, which is according to the flesh. And then we know in, in Genesis chapter six, he says that he did it. Noah, Noah heard it and therefore Noah did it. So he took that fear that he had, the, the message that he had, say, look, the world's going to end. This is going to happen. And he did it. And now you, we have the story of Noah, this man of faith, this this, this story of him building, building the ark, family getting on the boat, exactly what God had said. The waters come, the floods come, you know, they're floating in the world with a bunch of water around it. And, every, and, and everything is happening exactly how God said it, because God said it, and, and, and Noah did it. And so there's this great kind of picture for us, and how this really, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of application in this, but but the thing I think that was, the, at least the Lord was kind of drawing out to me was this idea of God telling us to do something that we're, we, we can't see. We don't know what's going to happen. God saying, do this, or go here, or say this, or whatever it may be. And we don't know what the end result is. We don't know. We may know, but we haven't seen it yet. You may, you may say, okay, this could happen, but I don't know how, what steps it's going to take to get there. And, and then when, that, when you go to take that step, that fear that dwells up in you, how are you going to react to that? Are you going to believe what God says, or are you, going to believe, are you not going to believe what God says? Because that will determine whether you continue to do what God tells you to do, if you believe his word. If you believe what God said is true, you believe his promises, you believe the things that he says are, are always going to come to pass, then you have this healthy fear that says, okay, I'm afraid, but God's going to do it. And Noah had that. Noah understood that because he had walked with God. He was a just man. He was righteous in his generation. He, was, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He had this relationship with Jesus and understood that God, when he says something, it's going to happen. And Noah doesn't step out into this, this, he doesn't take the step of faith and make the boat or make the ark and, and warn the people unless he's walking with God, unless he has a healthy understanding that God's word is true. Because if he doesn't believe that God's word is true, God's going to tell him these things, and he's going to say, yeah, right, I'm out of here. But because he believes in God's word, he believes in the promises of God, he does it. So he prepares it, he saves his household, he warns the people, and the rest of the story is that his family got on the boat, the animals got on the boat, and God destroyed the earth and started over. New covenant, with, with starting with Noah. Now, there's lots of things that um, we can go from here, and, and one of the things that w- has really been on my heart is stories like Noah, and then also I think of, um, and in, in Hebrews even, the next very person that they speak of is Abraham. You think of, of no, guys like Noah, Abraham, Moses, that if they would have never done what God told them to do, what, what would, what would, how, what would, how have history changed? Does that make sense to say, okay, if Noah, if Noah wouldn't have done what God said, if he, wouldn't have, if he wouldn't have built that boat, if he rejected that, now maybe God would have raised up someone else. It's very possible. I'm not saying that that's, we don't, you know, we want to be careful speculating in the Bible, but, but, but what if Noah said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. What would have happened? What, I mean, how, like, would have God raised someone else up? Maybe, possibly, most likely, but it wouldn't have been Noah. It would have been someone else. Or Moses, if he wouldn't have done what God told him to do, he would have never seen the miracles happen. If, if, he, doesn't, if he doesn't do what God says, he never goes to Pharaoh. He never sees the things happen that God did. He never sees the plagues come on Egypt. And, and he, never, he never witnesses taking the people out of the bondage of, of Israel and taking them into the wilderness and splitting the, the, you know, the Red Sea and, and watching all these wonderful, crazy things happen. I mean... Uh, Darren mentioned it the, this morning. I mean, he provided manna for these guys for 40 years every single day. I mean, to feed 
couple million people. That's a lot of food. You know, we had a conference here a couple months ago in October. We had like three food trucks and we tried to feed 400 people and it was really tough or 200 people, 250. And it took forever. Like it took like two hours or something, three hours to try to feed 200 people. Can you imagine getting a little manna food truck? All right, what do you want? Uh, you know, you want some sauce on that? Or, you know, or you want some tater tots with that? Or I, I, don't, I don't know what manna is because it literally means like, what is it? But so it could be anything you imagine. You know, I've, I've had some wonder bread where you have two pieces of bread and you wonder if there's going to be any meat in there or a wish or a wish sandwich, right? You've had the two pieces of bread and you wish there was some meat. Um, you know, I've, I've made tomato soup out of ketchup packages. I mean, I've, you get creative when you don't have much, right? Which is really gross, by the way, in case if you ever, you single guys, don't try that. Don't, don't go to the local fast food place and grab a handful of ketchup packets and put them in the pan and add water and heat it up. It's not good. Just take it from experience. It's not good. It's good that man shouldn't be alone, that he should be married. <laughs> anyway, that's really sidetracked. But, but, you know, if Moses wouldn't have stepped out and did what God told him to do, then you don't have the miracles. If David doesn't step out and do what God told him to do, you don't have the stories of David. You, you see, you, we have these great heroes of faith that, we, that we, we have these examples of. Hebrews chapter 11 is a great example. Abraham and, and Noah and, and, um, and Moses and Gideon and all these different people who've done such great things that we look at and think, man, they took such great steps of faith. If they wouldn't have believed what God's word said and did it, then we don't have these stories. And I look at my own life and think, I don't know what my story is exactly. Um, I mean, unless, you know, Jesus comes back, hopefully I, I'm here for a few more years, hopefully. Um, but I don't know what my story, when it's all said and done, is going to read. But I hope that I, whatever it is, that I try to do what God told me to do. And I believe God enough at his word to do it. Now, whatever the results are, that's up to him. But the reality is, is that my own life, I have to look at it and say, what is God telling me to do? And even though I'm afraid, I need to believe his word and do it. Because I don't want to have my story read. There was a lot of potential there. <laughs> you know, you think about Samson. Samson is a great example of this. All this great gifting, this great, you know, promise of God, this, this, co this, this covenant that he, he carried from, from his youth, wasted away because he wanted to go down to the, to the land of the Philistines and take, take a woman he shouldn't have taken. And he gets caught up in the world, caught up in his strength, caught up in, you know, this pride, doing what was right in his own eyes. And he died with his eyes gouged out, you know. And, uh, I mean, God somewhat, I don't know, I guess you can call it restored. I don't know if exactly it's restored, but in some ways it was. But, you know, Samson had all these things going for him, and he never lived up to the fullest potential he, he could have. And I know from my own life, there's lots of things that God wants me to do. And, I'm not, and, and, and some of this is big picture. Some of this is like, okay, yeah, God's will for my life. But some of this, this is like, what do you want me to do tonight? <laughs> you know, when I get home and I see a bunch of dishes in my, in, my, in my sink, you know, I can make a decision. Like, am I going to help my wife do these or not? You know, and there's, there's like these, there's these things that not, there's big picture things that God wants to do in our life. But there's also like little things like being kind to your wife or being nice to people or, or being a servant or whatever it may be. There's things that God will stir us up to do, and we go to do it, and we have to make this, this, this decision. Am I going to believe what God said? Am I going to do it? And it's a question, I think it's a tension that, that, uh, that I live with um, every day. We were joking um, uh, we're having some uh, having dinner with some friends, and we were joking about. Well, I, we weren't really joking; it wasn't a joke. But this idea of having this tension of like God telling you to do something, and you're faced with it every day. And and you know, the, one of the examples is is um, you know I drive, and I've shared this a few times, but where where I live and where the church is, uh, it's it's a lot of freeways and kind of um, in some some neighborhoods, and then and then then it's really all freeway. So every morning, every Sunday morning, especially, I think of this. Um, I drive, and not so much in the summertime, but in the wintertime when it's like 20 degrees. You drive early in the morning, and you see probably 10 homeless dudes, some girls, I guess, mostly dudes, 
underneath the bridge or underneath the freeway. And it's 20 degrees outside. And there's this tension every time I drive by, like, what is there something you want me to do? Is there something I, is there some way I can help them? Is there something I can do, whether it's small or maybe do they want help? You know, I've, I've worked downtown and lived downtown. I, I know that, that not all of them really want to talk with you or want your help or they don't, they just want to be, have some, you know, mind their own business. But is there something I can do? And there's this tension that seems like every time I get off the freeway or get on the freeway that I think to myself, Lord, is there something you want to do? Are you speaking to me? Are you giving me vision? Are you showing me what I, is, is, am I supposed to be doing something? What is it? And then I make another decision. Keep driving. <laughs> or, or, you know, as I hold my warm coffee and I'm sipping it and it's 20 degrees outside, like, man, that's, that's a bummer. Those guys are cold probably. And I got my heater up, cranked up, you know? And, and, and I, you keep driving and there's, that's something that I, you live with. Like, okay, I made a decision. Now, that's not to say, like, every time God's telling me to get out of my car and do something, but, but you guys understand what I'm saying, is there's these things that God tells us to do, and we could be afraid. We could be, we could have this fear. We could have this idea that we, we don't, we're not qualified. We're not able. We don't have the resources. We don't have the money. We don't have the space or whatever the, the thing may be. But if God tells you to do it, you have to believe that God is going to provide for the, for for the things that he's called you to do. You know, I remember hearing one time, I think it was a Bible study or maybe it was in conversation, someone talking about the idea of believing that Jesus is coming back. You know, like I remember there, I think it was a conversation they were saying, you know, people believe in the, you know, we believe in the book of Revelation. We believe that Jesus is coming back for us, one day we'll be caught up in the air, like Paul said. That we'll hear the trumpet. We, those that remain in the earth will be caught up in the air. We read the book of Revelation, and we think, man, this is awesome. Jesus is going to come back on a horse, on his thighs, and be read king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to have a sword. His eyes will be like a flame of fire, and out of his mouth will be like the word of God coming out. It's like an awesome imagery, you know? If like, someone painted that, like, that's a, put it in your, like, man cave or something. Like, this is Jesus coming back on the right. It's just awesome, right? And you think, man, this is great. This is awesome. Jesus, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna bind Satan. He's going to destroy, you know, he's going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going he's gonna to conquer sin and death ultimately forever. We're going to be with him. We're going to reign with him for a thousand years. Then we're going to be with him in heaven for eternity, singing glorious worship songs to him day and night. And, and one day will be like a thousand years, and a thousand years will be like one day. It won't even matter. We'll just be with Jesus forever. But then we say, Lord, how am I going to pay my utility bill? Right? We believe this wonderful thing, like, man, Jesus is coming back. He's awesome. He's powerful. He's almighty. But I don't know how my phone bill is going to be paid. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe my perspective isn't right. Like, if I believe that God is so great and awesome and wonderful, do I, do I believe that he's going to take care of my needs, my day-to-day needs? And the answer should be yes. If I believe that God could split the Jordan, if I believe, if I read the Bible and I think, man, this really happened, God... The Israelites, you know, God told Moses, you're not going to go in the promised land. Sorry, bro, you, you misrepresented me. Um, Darren looked at that story this morning a little bit. So God raises up Joshua, take the people into the promised land. They get to the Jordan River. They're like, okay, we've got a lot of people here. This river's kind of, kind of wide. What do we do? Jordan River splits. They walk on dry land into to the land towards Jericho. So if I read that story, I'm like, yeah, I believe that really happened. Then you go to Jericho, this walled city that they can't defeat. They're just, they're, they're, you know, they, these guys have been wandering around the wilderness like they've been training for war for the last 40 years. They've been eating manna, um, again, whatever that is. And now they get to the city, this land that God promised them. How are we going to defeat this, this great walled city? Well, why don't you circle around it a couple times? And then uh, when I tell you, just go ahead and yell as loud as you can and watch it happen, right? It's like, it's a ridiculous, like, strategy of war. Like, there's not a, there's not a general since then who's ever done that in a city, I imagine. I mean, I'm not a complete history buff, but I'm pretty sure Tommy Franks didn't, you know, didn't do it or, or uh, you know, all, this, all these great generals just escaped my mind. But, you know, Patton, Churchill, whoever else, right? All these great, awesome, awesome people who have helped defend our country. So, um, so 
they, they do it. The walls fall. They take Jericho. They had no business taking Jericho. So you read that and think, oh, man, this is, God's really awesome. And then I look at my own life and think, they'll never listen to me. <laughs> they'll just, they'll tell me I'm dumb or they'll, they'll, they'll fire me or they'll, they'll tell me, they'll tell me, get out of here. So, so somehow in my mind, there needs, there has to be some measure of faith. That I, do I believe in God's word? Do I believe that, that the God of the Bible is the same God that's working in my life that wants to do great things in my life? And I think Noah, in some aspects, some ways, that happened to him. He believed what God said, and he did it, even though it, was, it sounded and seemed ridiculous at the time. But he did it, and thankfully he did. Because what would happen is the water would stop, and the water would begin to come down, and then the land would begin to show, and no, they, would be, they would walk off the boat after some days, and they would begin to establish this land and this, this community and begin to multiply. And, and God, you have the rest of the story of this great this story of redemption throughout the whole Bible. I'm thankful that he did that. Noah was obedient to God's word, even though it took 120 years. Every single day, I think, you know, for my own life, I, when God tells me to do something, I think, okay, Lord, it's been three hours. I've been praying for three hours. Are you going to do this? <laughs> you know, it's been three days, or he told me to do this, and it's, it's been three days, or three months, or three years, or how about 120 years before you're complete, before you feel that first drop of rain? 120 years. It's a long time. So I look at my own life, and, I, and, and the application and my encouragement to you guys is each of us, God's calling us to do something. Now, some of us, it's, again, it's it's, maybe it's big picture stuff. Maybe God's put something on your heart and, and it's kind of, it's out of like, you know, you're telling someone and they're just like, you know, you ever, t- ever t- told someone with some of your ideas and they just kind of look at you, their eyes get all big and like, uh, I think you're crazy, right? Maybe it's something like that. It's awesome. Or maybe it's just something, you're going to go to work Monday morning and there's something that God's been telling you to do, an email he's been telling you to send or a person he's been telling you to talk to or someone he's been telling you to invite to lunch. And you think, man, if I invite this person to lunch, it's going to change. The relationship's going to change. The, the, it's going to get awkward. Or it's what I have to say. They may not want to hear it. And you think, man, I'm, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can hit that, e- send that email. Or I don't know if I can make this phone call. Or I don't know if I can have the courage to go up to this person and ask them if they want to go to lunch with me. I don't know if I can do it. Let me just tell you. God split the Red, the Red Sea, the Jordan. He's coming back in a white horse with it on his thigh, reading King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's, he's, king of, he's, he's Lord of all. He's mighty and awesome and powerful. He can help you have lunch with someone, <laughs> right? He can, he can help you send an email or, or talk with a family member. He can do those things because of who he is and what he's done in your life and in so many. So I encourage you, don't let, that, don't let fear have the victory. Don't let fear overcome the thing that God wants you to do. Now, I'm not going to be so foolish to say, don't be afraid. <laughs> I mean, there is some truth to that, but you're going to be afraid. It's just how it is, okay? But the fear that, that cripples people or the fear that hinders what God wants to do is that fear of not believing what God says. I'm afraid because I don't believe what God says. Now, you may be afraid, but you believe what God says, you're, go, you're okay. You're in, you're in the ballpark of Noah and Moses no, Moses said, I stutter, I can't go. You know, you're in, that, you're in that circle. If you're afraid and you don't believe what God says, then, you're in, then that's when you're disqualified, or that's when you are hindered of what God wants to do. So, so let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you, Lord, that the things that you say, the promises that you made, the things that you're calling us to do, Lord, you're going to do it. It's not a, a, not a fact of if you're going to do it. It's just the details, when or where, the timing of it. So I pray, Lord, you'd help us to trust you. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to look to you for that strength, that wisdom and, and obedience that we need to do the things that you're telling us to do. What I know in a room like this, we're here on a Sunday night, we, we wanted to just get one more, one more little, little portion before we start our week. 
and there's things that you're stirring up in our hearts and and there's things that you're calling us to do and there's things that you're wanting us people you're wanting us to talk to and situations you want us to deal with and we're afraid lord we don't know how we're going to have those conversations we don't know how those things are going to work out we don't know how that person's going to react or or if that situation will ever get better but we want to believe that what your word says is true that you're faithful lord that 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 when we're weak you're made strong when we lack wisdom you're the one who gives to us liberally if we ask you're the one who strengthens us when when we we've failed or are weak lord you're the one um i think of the times of 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 david you know um, giving him strength to, to, to endure the battle, giving him that strength he needed to defeat Goliath, or, or many times in the Bible, Jonathan is armor bearer, just giving him that wisdom and that courage to take the, take the hill. And so we pray, Lord, that you would, we would believe your word and hold it true and do great and wonderful things that would bring you much glory, much honor, and that, that many people, Lord, would know that God works in, in this world, that, that you're not done with us yet, that you have something for us. And so work in our lives and, and help us, Lord, to, to fight those battles, to overcome um, that fear and, and do what you're telling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, thanks.